My name is Ted Moore. I never believed in ghost farts till I came face to face with one. Face to face. Calm down, I'm just messing with y'all. So what was supposed to be an episode about the Washington Hotel in California and a little girl named Alma Russell that supposedly went missing from there and haunts the place has morphed into its own life to say the least. So there's two stories coming out of there. One was that it was a little girl and they found artifacts of her clothing during the renovation that hangs on a wall in there today that you can see. The other is that it was a younger woman with black hair that signed in every month for about two years and then just mysteriously stopped. Both are supposed to be the ghost of Alma. I set out to debunk this one. I wanted to break some hearts on it. Um, I figured on the lack of information alone, you're going to prove that this person never existed. Thanks to modern technology and records, I was dead wrong on that one. So what we did was we went through the county records. We found nothing. We went to two historical societies. We got a couple of leads. Those leads led us to Sacramento State University. There we did indeed find an Alma Rose Russell. She did indeed exist. The story was off by about 10 years, but she was a real person. She was four years old. She was the daughter of a pharmacist in Sacramento who would travel up to the mountain communities and supply them with um, medical supplies and drugs. Apparently they were quite the duo. They were very popular and they did indeed exist. Knowing that this little girl did exist and went missing tugged on my heart light as a parent and kind of my morbid curiosity at the same time. So what we did, we took it a step further. We started looking into arrest records during that time. That led us to San Diego State University and one Carl Panzram, yes, the serial killer. So he's in Fresno, California in 1911 under a different alias and he's arrested for stealing a bicycle. He's sentenced to six months in jail but only does 30 days before he escapes, hightails it to the mountains, hides in the trees to evade his capture. He starts working his way north trying to get into Oregon and he makes it as far as Auburn, California before he stops a train worker and a hobo and forces them to rape one another at gunpoint. If that's not disturbing for you enough, He's only two, three miles outside Washington, California at the same time Alma's there with her father. You see where this is going? We got a lot to digest. Let's just start from the beginning. Carl Panzeram. A life that was so evil it's hard to find good, if any, in it. Just as you and I get up to go to work and go about our daily business, Carl would wake up to murder, rape, robbing, and arson. Carl Panzeram was a walking example of the brutality of one person and the scope of damage they can cause. From death row, the killer wrote, In my lifetime I have murdered 21 human beings and I have committed over a thousand acts of sodomy on male human beings. For all these things, I am not the least bit sorry. No one knew about these crimes until he confessed to them. He would later go on to personally write President Hoover to ensure that his execution would be carried out on time. When opponents of capital punishment fought for his life, Panzeram responded with a venomous letter. I wish you all had one neck and I had my hands on it. Even after being led to the gallows, his last words would be to the executioner, Hurry it up, you bastard. I could have hung a dozen men in the time you've been fooling around. To better understand someone like Carl Panzeram, we first must step back and take a look at where the circus of dysfunction began. Born June 28, 1891 on a farm near East Grand Forks, Minnesota, he was the sixth of seven children. Panzeram and his six siblings were made to work on the family farm at a young age until truancy laws, which made it illegal for parents to not send their children to school, came into effect. Carl's parents were very angry about having to send their children to school during the day and forced him and his siblings to work the fields throughout the night instead. He would later report that he would get just two hours of sleep before he would have to get up and go to school. Punishments in the household range from being chained to being starved. He would reflect on his childhood with the sentiment that he was not liked by other children. By age five, he claimed that he was a liar and a thief, and he recalled that he became meaner the older he grew. Carl's father would abandon the family when he was only seven years old. Eventually, four of his five brothers also left as well. One of them ended up drowning. His run-ins with the law started as early as age 8 in 1899 when he was charged in juvenile court with being drunk and disorderly. Again at age 11 in 1903, he was arrested in jail for being drunk and incorrigible, a term that was used back in the day for detaining youths. 
Not long after that, and just getting started, he would again be arrested for stealing a cake, apples, and a revolver from a neighbor's home. Overly frustrated with his behavior, in October of 1903, Panzeram's mother sent him to the Minnesota State Training School. He would later write in his autobiography that he was repeatedly beaten, tortured, and raped by staff members. He hated the school so much that he decided to burn it down and did so successfully without detection on July 7th of 1905. By his early teens, he had exhibited alcoholism and had a lengthy criminal rap sheet. At age 14, a couple weeks after his parole and two weeks after attempting to kill a Lutheran cleric with a revolver, Panzeram ran away from home to live on the streets. He often traveled via train cars and later recalled having been gang raped by a group of homeless men on one of these occasions. Placed in the Montana State Reform School along with inmate Jimmy Benson, Carl escaped from the institution and began a crime spree of petty theft which lasted into the new year. At age 15, Panzeram got drunk in a Montana saloon, lied about his age, and enlisted in the United States Army. He was assigned to the 6th Infantry, but it would be no more of a home for the youth than was his family farm growing up. He would be charged with larceny, dishonorably discharged, and spend two years in prison at Leavenworth. He would claim that this was the hardest time he ever served, and any good left in him was now gone. Being subject to hard labor, he was now a monstrous mountain of muscle weighing 200 pounds and standing 6 feet tall. 1910 would see Panzeram moving about the country stealing anything he could get his hands on, from a bicycle to a yacht, and yes, this is a picture of a yacht he actually stole, but doing it so poorly that under his own name and a variety of aliases, he still spent time incarcerated in Oregon, Texas, and Fresno, California. Here's where Panzeram's record does look pretty impressive. After spending only 30 days in jail in Fresno, California, he escapes. He's found guilty on highway robbery, assault, and sodomy charges, spends three months in jail before escaping in Harrison, Idaho. He also escapes from Butte, Montana, and in Oregon. Only in Oregon, he tries to help a fellow convict escape and spends 61 days in solitary confinement munching on cockroaches before escaping in September of 1917. He engages in two gun battles with the police and will be recaptured and returned to the prison. But you guessed it, he once again escapes sawing through the bars of his cell and hobos it on a train going east. Race personified is how Panzeram now describes himself, often raping the victims that he's stealing from. Perfect for Panzeram's personality is the one job he successfully holds down during this period, breaking the arms and legs of Union strikers. He also tries to enlist in the Federal Mexican Army in 1910, a trip that also sees him attack and strangle a man once he returns to Texas for a payday of a whopping 35 bucks. Obtaining a seaman identification card in New York, Panzeram becomes an international menace when he sails to Panama as a crew member aboard the steamship James S. Whitney. From Panama, there are criminal adventures in Peru, Chile, London, Edinburgh, Paris, and Hamburg. After killing everybody aboard the ship, Panzeram catches another ship to South Africa and lands in Luanda. In 1921, he is the foreman of an oil rig and he later burns it down out of what he says, spitefulness. With a history of raping over a thousand men, it's important to take note that it's here in South Africa that we get our first evidence of him raping a girl. After burning down this oil rig, Panzram seeks out a virgin girl. He pays a local resident $8 in exchange is given a 12-year-old girl whom he rapes in his shack later that night. He returns the girl to his family demanding the money back on the suspicion that the girl was not an actual version. The family then gives Panzeram an 8-year-old girl whom he also rapes in the shack but eventually returns her claiming that she too was not a virgin. So as I'm sitting here today, I wish I could tell you that Carl Panzeram cleans up, finds Jesus, changes his life around, but unfortunately nothing's further from the truth. His crimes only get more heinous and horrific as he moves along. But there's two things that we can take away at this point. One is that he confesses to raping over a thousand men and boys in his lifetime. The other is when he's on the East Coast near New Jersey, we have records of him raping another six girls between the ages of 12 and 4 years old. One of them he tries to strangle to death after he robs and murders her mother. I think it's fair to assume at this point that's not about sexual preference, but more about taking, robbing, and murdering the innocence of normal people. 
This leads me to believe that he is responsible for the disappearance and murder of Amaro. So what we're going to do, we're going to go over to the Washington Hotel. I'm going with Paranormal NV. We're going to meet up with uh, Bones Paranormal. We're going to conduct an investigation and see if we can get in contact with Ama Rose, her spirit. See if she'll tell us what happened with her disappearance and possibly who murdered her. For tonight's investigation, I'm giving the girls very little information to go off of. All they know is that a little girl went missing from this hotel. They do not know her name or the circumstances behind her disappearance and death. I'm hoping it's their investigation and evidence that will prove, one, who we are talking to, and two, who is responsible for her disappearance and death. As the girls get focused and dialed in on the night ahead of us, I'm hoping that they will take the lead on this investigation. If little Alma Rose was indeed killed by Carl Panzeram, I'm afraid that my presence there might make her feel scared or intimidated. Having the girls there, I hope, will make her feel more comfortable and open and willing to communicate with us. Is there anyone here with us today? What about the little girl? Is there a little girl here with us? Can you tell us your name? Got it. <laughs> okay, can you name anybody in here? What's the name of the little girl that haunts this place? Are you a good spirit or a bad spirit? Rose. Amazingly, we're able to pick up the three words Alma, Rose, and Chris. Russell on our necrophonic, which is the full name of the little girl that went missing from this hotel. Downstairs, and Allison is using the bathroom, and I have the millimeter to go around and look. We've already put chalk at the doors, and they might be a little flimsy because of all the movements, but.
I don't know if that was already knocked over or someone else, but that one is on the floor. I think that was the door that we kept walking in too, so that was the only available place in here. Pretty much everyone in the group gets really bad vibes from this hallway. If you can and if you're able to, can you please make a noise using this machine in my left hand? It will not hurt you if you do, and I do not have any intentions on bringing any harm to you. If you can, and if you're able to, can you please make your presence known? Was that classmates we had? Uh, yeah, they knocked it out when they are walking out the room. Where'd they go? They're all downstairs. Oh, seems having issues. With what? That little girl. You see me that prior. Oh, she's. Oh my gosh. We're gonna get away from her. We're gonna get away from her. We're gonna go downstairs. It's just us. Are you okay? No. What is going on? I don't know. With the wee hours of the morning now upon us, we break off into two groups. Mari and Lily head over to room number four to investigate where Alma was last seen alive and disappeared from. You ready? What are we doing? We are going to be using a pendulum to try to communicate with the spirits. Pendulum basically works just by, they can manipulate it to move either forward, backward, sideways, or like in circles, depending on what you tell them. You can ask yes or no questions, it's the easiest way. Um, we'll start off with, is there anyone here with us? If so, spin the pendulum counterclockwise. Is your name Rose? No. Is your name related to something like a flower? But you are the little girl from the hotel? Just to confirm. Please. Alright, good to know. Uh, could you possibly touch the reader for us? The little machine right next to us. Are you willing to use it? No. Alright. Is this your favorite room in the house? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Evet. 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 Did you die at this hotel? Yeah. Are you okay with sharing how you died? Could you please stop the dungeon? Are you the little blonde girl that passed away in this hotel? Would you like us to leave? Are you being held here not to talk to us? Is there any way you can close the bathroom door or move it slightly? Anyone that that's in here with us right now? Try to move the bathroom door. Savannah, where are your hands? Um, blue light. Where are both your hands? I got a weird shadow on the, the door. I just wanted to verify that it wasn't your hand blocking out the light. Does Allison's raver pants scare the crap out of you? Can you mess with one of the zippers on there? Can you touch one of the girls? I'm going to get yelled at for that one. Would you be able to touch my hand? Do we have established if it's a man, woman, child? It's a little girl, actually. We asked her and she said, yeah. Is okay. it you? Go stop the pendulum and then spin in, a, spin in a circle if it's still the little girl that's in here with us. Are you the girl in the photo in the hallway right over there? The one with the doctor? No, you're not? No. Is there such a name? Was it Rose? And it's not flower related. Was it a common name when you were your age? Yes. Do you know when she died? Or when she went missing? You know how you died? Oh, it helps out a Yes. Was it a tragic death? Did you die of natural causes or was your death... What, did you die of natural causes? No. No. Did someone harm you that which is what led to your death? Are you stuck here with that person? 
Is that why you would like to not communicate out loud? That's totally fine. I understand. All right, so we just wrapped up investigating the Washington Hotel. It was an interesting night. We got some good stuff on the spirit box, getting Alma Rose Russell coming through. That was pretty cool. When the two group medians, Ellison and Savannah, tried to reach out to the spirit, both got an overwhelming negative vibe that she died not of natural causes, but more along the lines of murder. Ellison's having issues. You okay? Oh, what is going on? I don't know. We saw Mariana and Lily with the pendulum do a great job just kind of backing up and verifying the evidence that we collected on the night on who we were talking to and how she might have died. Nicole and myself, we hit up the hallways with the SB7 trying to get in communication with Carl Panzram. We got some good stuff, but I'm going to call it inconclusive. My biggest takeaways from this is that Carl Panzram confesses to murdering over 21 men in his lifetime. If you hop on Google or talk to an expert, they'll tell you that that number could go north of 100. Does that mean Carl Panzram is responsible for the disappearance and death of Alma Rose? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But what I can verify is that they are both in the same area at the same time, and this absolutely fits Carl Panzram's behavior and lifestyle. If I'm a detective, he is number one on my suspect list. You guys let me know what you think. Hit me up in the comment section. Let's continue this conversation.